Well, as I did yesterday, I will do today because I always do because I need your help. So if you could just pray for me for a moment that I'll speak the Lord's words to you, that we can really listen, the theme of this talk, that we can listen especially to him and open our hearts to him, to what he wants to say to each one of us. So if we could just pray for each other for a moment. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Fill us, Lord. Speak to us. Pour your love into my brother's heart. And let's ask for the intercession of the great listener, the one who heard the word so clearly he became flesh in her womb. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. One of the beautiful things about Unbound is precisely this dimension of listening. A, a large portion of the Unbound prayer session is listening, giving a, chance, giving a person a chance to speak, to share their story, to put their experience into words, to capture some way of both speaking the, the pain, the struggle, the, the wound, the bondage, the, the fear, to share their experience, and then also ultimately helping them to do the renunciations, offer the forgiveness, be able to speak their repentance and receive that, that freedom and ultimately receive the Father's love. But that dimension of listening is something that I found very beautiful about Unbound from the beginning. I come from the direction of, uh, of spiritual direction. I'm the spiritual director for our seminary, St. Vincent Seminary in Latrobe, and I do a lot of listening. When I first experienced Unbound and saw that the primary thing is, is listening, helping someone to share their story and to speak from the depths. Again, I was able to make that connection. It's not some kind of weird ministry in the basement. It's really an extension of the kind of ministry that we already understand and just the keys help us to capture some key elements and then offer those to people to pray and to find freedom. So, compassionate listening, transformative listening is, a, is an important part of Unbound. One of the most beautiful words that we hear, and we hear them in Unbound sessions, as you have likely also heard them in spiritual direction, in pastoral counseling, in confession, I've never told this to anyone before. I don't know if there's anything that thrills my heart more than to hear that, and I don't know if there's anything that summons my attention more than when someone says that. I've never said this to anyone before, because what we're on the verge of in that moment is a lot of freedom. A lot of times, the things that control us are the things that we hold in the darkness, and merely exposing them to the light has a way of emptying out the enemy's power. It's rule number 13 for those of you who are Ignatian uh, aficionados. Rule number 13, bring everything into the light. But in order to bring everything into the light, we need to know that someone can hear us. We need to know that we're safe. We, know that we need to know that we can express that and someone is listening. And to listen like that is one of the greatest gifts we can offer to people. I would invite you, first of all, to... Think about your own experience, and I would offer these two key reference points. You can hopefully take a few things from the talk that I give, but I encourage you to go beyond that and do your own reflection on what is a path of compassion, of transformative listening. But I think the two key reference points are, first of all, our own experience. So I want to pause for just a minute and let you think about a time that someone really listened to you in a way that you could really open your heart and could even find healing. Just reflect on that for a moment.
And what made that listening so powerful? And how did it make you feel to be listened to like that? I think it's always good to start from that place of our own experience, and especially when we feel like, when we feel how it was to be listened to, how transforming, how healing that was, that's the gift that we want to be able to give to others. Our second critical reference point is, how has Jesus listened to us? We all have a relationship with him, or we wouldn't be in this room. How has he listened to us? Maybe one of those times in prayer that you felt like you could really express your heart, that he really saw you, that you felt unconditionally loved. And a lot of times, those two things are going to go together. The way that you experience the love and listening of Jesus is going to be at least somewhat informed by the way that others have listened to you. And... Vice versa, sometimes we have a hard time believing that God listens because some of those who should have listened to us didn't do a very good job of that, and that's even a place of healing. But it's good to to go back to those places. How have others listened to me, and how has Jesus listened to me? We know that Jesus is, in fact, such a good listener. Sometimes we wish he would do more speaking, but he's a very good listener. And we should know that even when he is silent, it's not because he's absent. It's because he's listening. He wants to draw even more from our hearts. We can think about some times that Jesus listened going to the scriptures. One of those times is the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4. It's a, a very unusual encounter. Jesus meets this woman at the well and begins this dialogue that's interesting and we can pull that apart. But at the end of it, He listens, he engages her, and then he speaks this truth to her that makes her go off and say, he told me everything I ever did. And we think, no, he didn't. He just told you about these five husbands. It's not everything you ever did. But what that means is that he really got to the bottom. He got to the very bottom. He got to the deepest place in her. He heard the deepest place in her. He actually saw it, and he didn't condemn her. He drew her out into the light. And when that deepest place was seen, when she was able to say her equivalent of, I've never told this to anyone before, she felt loved and listened to in a way that she felt he totally knew her. That's the kind of listening that we want to offer. In the very process of listening, there can be healing. We see that in the story of the man with the withered hand. You know, Jesus is in the synagogue. The Pharisees have this guy with a withered hand, and they want to put Jesus to the test. And Jesus engages them a little bit. And then eventually he says to the man who is probably so embarrassed, he's got this hand kind of hidden away. It's the sign of all of his shame gathered together. It's the sign of his curse that he's done something wrong, however they were conceiving about that. He doesn't want anybody to see that hand. And what does Jesus say to him? Stretch out your hand. And that's what we really invite people to do in Unbound. We invite people to do that in our own ministry with them. Have the courage to be vulnerable, to share that deepest fear, that deepest wound. Jesus says, stretch out your hand. And the scripture says, as he stretched it out, it was healed. So Jesus didn't even do anything after that. He didn't say anything. He didn't touch his hand. He didn't spit on him or anything. You know, he just, as he stretched it out, it was healed. And a lot of times there's healing simply in the listening. When we give people a space to be vulnerable and to share that deepest place, that deepest fear, that place of shame, and they can stretch that out, they find healing. Jesus also 
listens through entering into our experience. And ultimately, that's the way that he redeems us, by taking all of our wounds on himself, all of our sin on himself. There's real empathy. He enters in. He hears us enough to allow us to impress all of our stuff on him. All of our wounds are on his heart. We can communicate all of that to him, and he takes it in so deeply. This is the kind of model of listening for us. And we have it also with Our Lady. There's that beautiful verse in Luke chapter 2 where it says, Simeon prophesies to her, your own heart will be pierced by a sword that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And the word in Greek is dialogismoi, the thoughts. It has a sense of kind of thoughts that are at each other dia or or cut apart. There's a kind of struggle, division, confusion. It's this wrestling interior, interior thoughts that we often carry around, those kinds of struggles. And what a gift it is when someone listens to us well enough that we can put it into words, just being able to express it. And Our Lady enters into the pain. And a good listener also enters into the pain of someone who's struggling, who's wrestling, who has all of these conflicting thoughts and struggles to finally allow that person, help that person, put it into words and express it, expose that place of shame and confusion that's in their lives. So I want to go through a list. I didn't count the number of bullet points uh, like some of the previous talks, but anyway, a a list of qualities of transformative listening. And I'd say the, the first is that it's always very gentle and In fact, we can see a number of words going together. St. Paul lists them several times. We know the qualities of love that he starts with. Love is patient. Love is kind. We also hear that joined together with the words gentle and humble. In Ephesians 4 and in Colossians 3, I think, he talks about being humble, gentle, kind, patient. These are qualities of good listening. The word for patience in, in Greek is, really means it's closer connected with long-suffering, slow to anger. It has a, has a sense of holding ourselves back, not lunging in, not speaking too quickly, but holding ourselves back and so giving someone room to speak, giving someone a space that they can speak into. Humble, kind, gentle, that we listen in a way that someone is not afraid of us because often the things that we express are so tender, so fragile, so sensitive that any rough movement, any harsh word, any resistance from us can cause a lot of pain in that space. Our listening has to be very, very gentle. We can think of really receiving someone's heart. It's like heart surgery. Now, I've never held my, uh, someone's heart in my hands, but I've talked to doctors and nurses who have and what it's like to actually compress a heart, to to cause the heart to beat, to hold someone's heart in our hands. It's really what we're doing when we invite people to speak from the deepest places, to share the deepest wounds, to share the deepest hopes and joys, to really share things that they've never expressed to anyone. We hold their heart in our hands, and and the slightest movements can do a lot of damage when we have that exposed heart. There's a reason that God normally hides it behind a rib cage. But when we hold that heart in our hands, we have to be so gentle. Small movements can do a lot of damage, but small movements can also cause great, lead to great healing. And again, that's one of the beautiful things that can happen in Unbound is as someone opens their hearts and we can really receive that and help them to speak truth into it help them to rearrange some of those thought patterns and to stand against the schemes of the enemy who has sowed some of that in their hearts can lead to great healing. Also in our listening, it's so important to give our full attention. The word tender and the word attention have that same root. It's it's actually an Indo-European root. T-E-N means stretched. It's also tendon tender, attention. It has to do with being stretched. And when we give someone our attention, it does really stretch us. Uh, Matt Lozano was saying to me earlier, he said, you know, I can teach, I can speak for five hours with no problem. I'm not tired at all, but a couple of unbound sessions, that uh, the attention that's required to listen to someone, he said, that just really drains me. 
to really hold ourselves in tension, to keep our full attention on the person who is speaking, that we're not thinking about the weather, that we're not planning our next meeting, that we're not thinking about what happened three hours ago, that we're not checking our watch or looking at our phones or answering the phone, to actually give someone our full attention. It's really one of the most precious gifts we can give because one of the most limited resources we have is time. And to actually dedicate time to people, listening to them, to give them that attention is a tremendous gift, but also is a, is a real sacrifice. So our eye contact, letting the person really be the whole world, letting the rest of the world melt away for us for that hour, for half hour, whatever it is that we're listening to someone, for an unbound session or for a confession, how easy it is for us to be distracted in confession, to have a phone in one hand and the confessional screen on the other side of us. It's a terrible disservice. I think Cardinal Seurat used stronger words for it. But to give our full attention to someone is really a tremendous gift so that we can also listen to the Holy Spirit at the same time. What's the Lord saying? How is he speaking to us? What's going on inside of us? What is the other person saying to us? Our full attention. And likewise, giving our loving attention to someone that we're really predisposed to love them. Pope Francis in uh, The Joy of the Gospel used this word accompaniment that's become very popular in, uh, in our days now, but the art of accompaniment, it's a beautiful expression. He says, the church will have to initiate everyone, priests, religious, and laity, into this art of accompaniment, which teaches us to remove our sandals before the sacred ground of the other. It's a beautiful expression. If I can come back to that quality of humility, to actually come before someone with the humility of realizing this person has something that I cannot receive in any other way except from this person. Each one of us is a unique incarnation of the body of Christ. Each one of us carries God in our souls in a unique way and expresses Him in a unique way. And there's no way that I can know God in this way except through this person. And to actually have that kind of attention, that kind of loving attention and reverence for the person that's in front of me. And so, using that image of Moses from the burning bush, to remove our sandals before the sacred ground of this other person, to actually come with that humility. I think one of the great dangers for us as priests is we do have so much experience with people, so we're tempted to think that we have all the answers. And that all the person needs is an answer. In fact, the person needs to be able to express and come to the answer largely on their own. And even if we help them along, I love that image that Janet used of a midwife. A midwife obviously does something, but it's the woman giving birth that's doing all the work. And her body already knows how to do that. Our souls, our minds, filled with the Holy Spirit, know how to find healing and know how to find answers to our problems, but just need a little bit of help, a little bit of coaching, a little support to come and do that and help people to put it into words. So to come alongside someone that, like that, and Pope Francis says, this pace of, the pace of this accompany, accompaniment must be steady and reassuring, reflecting our closeness and our compassionate gaze which also heals, liberates, and encourages growth in the Christian life. So we really come before someone with faith, with faith that God is in this person, that the Holy Spirit, at least through their baptism, that they've been given faith and hope, the theological virtues, that the Holy Spirit can make a dwelling place in this person and is alive in this person. We come before them with faith and confidence, and that loving attention seeing more in them than they see in themselves. When we can do that, we can also help them to see the gift that they are. There's a psychologist, uh, Dr. Conrad Bars, who took elements of uh, a Thomistic 
anthropology and applied them to, to the practice of psychology and has some beautiful books, I Give You a New Heart and Healing and Feeling Your Emotions, uh, Born Only Once, a number of beautiful books. But he talks about affirmation and uh, affirmation not just in speaking words to someone, but affirmation in a whole kind of stance towards the person. And he describes that in three levels. He really pulls apart uh, and, and makes distinctions that we often don't think of. But he starts at the level of, of our belief, that we really believe in the goodness of the person that's in front of, in front of us, that this person is good in themselves, not just because of something they can do, not just because of something they can offer, not just because of what they may be in the future, but is already good. That fundamental belief, this person is good. And then secondly, we allow ourselves to be moved by that goodness, to allow ourselves to feel that and to know it inside of us, to not be indifferent. We're not doing a surgical technique. I always say if you're doing unbound, like Google, then you're not doing Unbound. If, if, if a search bar could replace you, type in these spirits, type in these experiences, type in these inputs, and I'll give you the outputs, and that's some kind of formula, and you can speak it, then it's not Unbound. It's not priestly ministry. I don't, it's, it's electronic, right? It's technological. But part of what we offer is our own human response we offer our own hearts, we offer our own presence, our attention, our affirmation of the goodness of this person, and we stay before them. We allow ourselves to be moved by them. And then, having received the gift of the person, then we're able to give that back. We give that back by our eye contact, we give it back by our words, we give it back by small gestures. But when we have this kind of affirming love for someone, we give them the gift of themselves. And we, we need someone to give us the gift of ourselves in a very fundamental way and then for that also to be renewed. And that really creates a bond of trust that helps us also to take their hand and lead them through the prayers. They're able to repent and to forgive, to renounce. They're able to do that deeper work because they have the strength of our presence, of our love, of our affirmation. Another quality of transformative listening is, is being able to echo back what the person is saying to us. And it's one of the beautiful things about Unbound is being able to give a word to that. You know, someone, someone says to us, you know, sometimes I, I felt so terrible that I wished I would die. And we can give them, you know, can, can we say that there's a spirit of suicide at work in there? And, and can we just name that? Okay, we're going to put that down. And, and as, as Janet said, after the session, sometimes we say it to them along the way, and it helps to tag that experience. When my, when my own uh, father scared me and there was fear that came to me, having Neil identify that, was there a spirit of fear that came to you at that moment? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's what happened. And now I have a, a word to hold on to. And then when we come back to the time of prayer, I'm able to express that. But when we offer that to someone, is that a spirit of, uh, or uh, as they were saying earlier, you know, if there's, if there's resentment, uh, that, that young man who was catching the ball, his father was throwing it harder and harder, and he's catching it, and he stands up, and he's angry. Resentment, and then bitterness, even hatred, possibly murder, and we can walk through that. I'm not going to tell a person, oh, you have a spirit of murder. I'm going to ask, you know, was, was there even a desire that your father would disappear, that he would go away forever? You know, that could be a spirit of murder at work. Let's renounce that. Let's cover that. And so we give word to these experiences. And then that also helps the person know that we're really hearing them. It's helpful in our other ministry as well to, to name things, to give a word to it. it. Helps us to know that we're hearing. At the same time, it is important to ask those clarifying questions. Part of good listening is asking clarifying questions. We're always in danger of thinking, oh, I already know this one. Yeah, I know what your problem is. <laughs> if you feel that way, stop right there. Don't say that. 
ask, always ask. Even if we're right about it, it's so important not to get ahead of people. Let them say it by asking clarifying questions. Is it, uh, you know, is, did you feel a lot of anger in that moment? Did you really hate your father in that experience? Were you terrified of what he was going to do to you? No, 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 that's, that's not it. I was, I was afraid that, you know, let them correct you. Let them change the words. Let them use their own way of saying it. Because ultimately, we're trying to engage the freedom of those that we're ministering to. We want them to be able to take ownership and, and be able to express that. Another thing that can, uh, that's really important to keep track of is, is not to be distracted by the smoke screens. You know, when, when there's something that's really tender underneath, uh, in fact, we can track our own feelings. Really, there's nothing more lovable than vulnerability. When someone really shares something with us that's, that's vulnerable, that's tender, the kinds of things they haven't told anybody before, the kinds of things that make a tear come and make their voice quiver a little bit, the things that are so shameful that they're afraid that we're going to say something hurtful to them. We've all heard these confessions. We've probably all made these confessions. When someone speaks that vulnerable, there's nothing more lovable than that. And our hearts are naturally moved by that. On the other hand, there's perhaps nothing more ugly than defenses. When people are justifying, when they're making excuses, when they're talking around things, when they're blaming everybody, when they're complaining about everything, when they have all of their issues with uh, this thing and that thing, they're quoting all kinds of stuff, and, and we just want to react to all of that and stop it or even resist them and shut it down. We can be aware of what's happening ourselves in those moments too, but don't be distracted. It's always a smoke screen. The really interesting thing is on the other side of that. What are they protecting so vehemently with all of this blaming and complaining and excusing and justifying and all of this stuff that's, uh, that's going on in, in front of that? So if we can not react to that and let, often we have to let it wash over us a little bit. Again, in an unbound session, we can name some of that. You know, is there a... Do, you, you, do we need some, some forgiveness there uh, for that person that you're, you're blaming everything for? Is it, do we need some, some uh, renounce complaining, renounce the blaming? So always try to see beyond that. Ask the Holy Spirit to, to help you. And, and even to ask it can be helpful. It sound, sounds like there's something really tender under there. Is there uh, some fear there? Is there some hurt? Wherever there's anger, there's pretty much always some hurt. There's a place that someone feels powerless, feels helpless, and when we can get at that, then we can, we're, we're really starting to get to the, to the root of things. Another uh, beautiful aspect of compassionate, transformative listening is offering a gaze of love. We hear this in the scripture, the rich young man, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Often without saying anything, we can look into the eyes of others. Pope Francis said in the uh, Misericordiae Vultus in his inauguration for the year of mercy, he said, mercy is the fundamental law that dwells in the heart of every person who looks sincerely into the eyes of his brothers and sisters on the path of life. When we really look sincerely into the eyes of others, mercy is what naturally wells up in our hearts. When we really see the person, when we haven't reduced them to a problem, when they're not just an interruption in our schedule, when they're not just an obstacle for us, when we see the person, gaze into their eyes and look with love. I think of the, the story of the blind man. It's another beautiful example of when Jesus listened, the, the blind beggar, Bartimaeus, who cried out, was sitting there and cried out. The apostles told him to be quiet. But Jesus heard his cry, was listening, and he went over to him. And then we have a great example of what Jesus invites us also to do. What does he do? He doesn't say, hey, you're blind. Do you want me to heal you? He says, what do you want me to do for you? He gives him a chance to put it into words. And maybe we can get inside the heart of the blind man how hard was it for him to say that? 
I mean, who ever heard of someone healing a man born blind? Who's ever done this before? And for him to have the courage to say, I want to see. Jesus allowed him to engage his freedom, to make an act of faith and to step forward in that. And then he heard it and he said, have your sight. And then if we think, what was the first thing the blind man saw? He saw the eyes of Jesus. How beautiful. And that's what we want to be able to offer people as well. Because our bondage makes us blind. Really, when we're leading people in unbound, when we're breaking the chains, we're really giving people sight again. And the first thing they should see is Jesus. We should be Jesus to them. And our eyes should be open and able to communicate him to them. That gaze of love. We can think also about the way that Jesus looked at the woman caught in adultery Whatever you may think about Jesus writing on the ground, the fact is that he was on the ground. And what it enabled him to do was at least to be level with her, maybe also even to look up at her. Jesus bent down beneath a prostitute or at least a woman caught in adultery. He bent down beneath this sinner woman and he looked up at her and he gazed at her. And she could feel that. He didn't look down on her. And that's the posture also that we need for that compassionate listening. When we put ourselves in the position of, I'm the priest, I'm the deacon, I'm the one with all the answers, come to me and I'll fix all your problems, pour all this out. And then when we put ourselves in that dominant position, it doesn't create the space that people need to really be able to open their hearts. But when we can bend down like Jesus, look up at the one who comes to us, and look at them with love. In compassionate listening, we also can't be afraid of silence. There's always a temptation to fill the silence. A lot of times, silence can be a a precursor to someone bringing out the deepest things, those things that are hardest to say. Now, some people tend to spill things out, a little more extroverted person, but A more introverted person really tries to gather it up, is formulating the words inside of themselves, is trying to to make, make a sentence out of it and then have the courage to express it. And it's so painful when someone just walks into that space and has to fill the silence. Well, what else, what else do you want to, what else do you have to, what, what, what else do you, you know, when we allow our own anxieties and nervousness to, to cloud up that space, if we can hold ourselves back, have the patience the long suffering even, to hold ourselves back and maintain our attention, look with that gaze of love and maybe a little encouragement. It's okay, take your time. It's all right. Anything else that you want to share? Take your time. Also useful is when asking a question, as uh, Janet was saying, we, we often in Unbound at least ask the question, you know, what was your relationship with, like, with your parents? A lot of times people will say first, I don't know. Don't jump into that. I don't know is a precursor to, I'm going to tell you the important thing now. It's very helpful to realize that. Let the I don't know stand, followed by a little silence, and then the rest of it will come out. They just are not totally willing to commit to it, and so they put the I don't know as a kind of, uh, you know, uh, hedging their bets at the, at the front of it. So let those silences draw out a little bit more. Look with love. And one of the things that's going to happen when we listen to people, whether in Unbound or in any other setting, is if we're really listening, we're going to really feel our poverty. And especially if we put this burden on ourselves that we have to have all the answers. I'm the priest, I'm the deacon, I have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the answers. You just need to listen and love the person. Let the Holy Spirit be at work and trust that God wants to do more than we even dream of in every encounter. And so we have to learn to sit in our own poverty. There's a real poverty that we feel when we don't know what to do. Wow, this is really big. I can't believe this person was, was, was abused like that. 
suffered like that. I can't believe the stuff that they're saying. And we feel the, the poverty of that. I don't know how to help them. And sometimes just the encouragement that we're still listening. Thank you for sharing that. That must have been really hard. We're going to pray through that. We're going to try to find some freedom from that. Just expressing your presence, reassuring. The less we think we know, the better we will listen. So the more poor that we can be, that we can realize I've never encountered this person before, or at least I've never encountered this person at this time before. And I can't know what's inside of this person unless they share it with me. The less we think we know, the better we will listen. And so to really empty ourselves out, allow ourselves to be really poor before the mystery of this person. I mean, the fact is, we don't even really know what's going on in ourselves, let alone go know what's going on in anybody else. And just to be in that place of poverty. There's a... There's a beautiful book called Poverty of Spirit. If you haven't read it, really encourage it. He, he talks about the, you know, the, the limitations, the poverty of our humanity. But he says, every genuine human encounter must be inspired by poverty of spirit. We must forget ourselves in order to let the other person approach us. We must be able to open up to the other person to let that person's distinctive personality unfold, even though it often frightens or repels us. We often keep the other person down and only see what we want to see. And so we never really encounter the mysterious secret of their being. We only encounter ourselves. Failing to risk the poverty of encounter we indulge in a new form of self-assertion and pay a price for it, loneliness. Because we did not risk the poverty of openness, our lives are not graced with the warm fullness of human existence, and we are only left with a shadow of our real self. Entering into that poverty, listening, encounter, is always entering into a poverty that never feels particularly comfortable. Although as that unfolds and the encounter deepens and we have the reward of seeing something beautiful happen before us, God rewards us far more than we give. Another quality of compassionate listening is, is to really allow ourselves to be impressionable. So to, to allow our hearts to be soft like wax, that we don't come hardened with our own defenses, that we don't come, in a, in a sense, uh, ready to battle against the other person. We need to be ready to battle against the enemy, but in a way that protects the person. I love uh, the image of, of the masculine heart in particular as being like a medieval castle with high walls, strong outward-facing defenses, but then this soft interior. The walls are there for the sake of the interior. And when we really listen to someone, we let them inside the castle. We allow them to pierce our hearts by the beauty of their person, by the mystery uh, that, they, that they open up to us, and we let them in. So we allow ourselves to, we allow them to make an impression on us, like soft wax. Like our lady's womb. Conrad Barr has used uh, another image for affirmation that I, I like very much. He said it's like, affirmation is like water. The qualities of water, the way that it, it shapes itself around something, so you can think of a, a fish or a plant or a coral or whatever, water has a way of shaping all the way around it. When we really listen to someone, we, we follow the contours of their story. We allow their uniqueness to emerge. We, we shape ourselves around them. And then water also has a way of, of protecting. You know, if you try to hit something, when you, when you swing something at water, it cushions the blow. And there's a way that our affirmation does that as well, as we enfold the person in this protective space 
of our encounter. Water also has a way of covering over the blemishes. So what we see through water looks a little bit nicer than it does when it's uh, brought out. And that's also a way we see people in the best light. We see them through, the, through God's eyes. We see them with love. And so the, the perfect image of that water and that affirming love is, is the mother's womb, where we're enfolded in the, the water sack, as it were, of the womb that, that shapes itself around that baby, which is most vulnerable. The most vulnerable we are is as a baby in the womb and to have that safe space. So to create that kind of womb of the heart to be able to receive people in listening is so transforming. Pope Francis, in his uh, 2016 message for the World Day of Communication, that's the, that was in the year of mercy, he spent the whole message on listening. It's very beautiful. I really encourage uh, reading the whole thing, but I just want to read a little piece of it. He said, he, he recognizes listening is never easy. Many times it is easier to play deaf. Listening means paying attention, wanting to understand, to value, to respect, and to ponder what the other person says. And I love this. He says, it involves a sort of martyrdom or self-sacrifice. So when we feel that, we can know it's working. When we feel like we're dying as someone is pouring out their hearts to us, it's working. Good. There is a kind of martyrdom. There's a self-sacrifice. We're setting aside all of our own concerns. We're setting aside the other things that seem to be pressing. We're really making space for a person to be able to reveal their whole self, their deepest secrets, their greatest shame, the deepest wounds to help them go to the depths. They need that space, and we die for that. It involves a sort of martyrdom or self-sacrifice as we try to imitate Moses before the burning bush. We have to remove our sandals when standing on the holy ground of our encounter with the one who speaks to me. Knowing how to listen is an immense grace. It is a gift which we need to ask for and then make every effort to practice. There's a, a woman, Judith Glazer, who did some research on, on listening, on conversations. She actually worked with uh, children with autism and was, was interested in the kinds of engagement that she was able to have and noticed that there were some different qualities and wanted to understand that more deeply and then engaged in a fairly intensive research project, also measuring uh, the... the the brain waves and identifying what's happening inside of people biochemically when, when conversations are taking place. And she identified three levels of listening based on the, the research. The first level she called transactional. And that's the kind of listening when we, that we do when we're information gathering. So maybe at the social here in a few minutes, you meet somebody new, you do some transactional conversation. Who are you? Where are you from? How long have you been a priest? Uh, how's your ministry? Have you had a good time at the conference? Whatever. We're just, just information gathering. The dynamic is ask and tell, and it's, uh, and it's important. So none of these is, is sort of bad, but uh, that basic first encounter, we do that to get on the same page, to harmonize, to connect the... Second level of listening she calls positional, and this is what happens when we start to debate a point, when we start to put my position out against your position. There's a recognition that you have a position, you have an opinion, and there's a certain respect for that, but I'm also trying to put forward my opinion, and I may be listening to you in a, a way that I'm looking for a hole in your argument, or I'm looking to nuance your thinking, I'm looking to convince you of something. It's positional. We're, we're jockeying for position a little bit. Now, both of these first two levels of conversation are, again, they're, they're natural ways. Even as we get to know each other, we, we find out the basic data, and then I, I kind of want to find out what kind of priest you are. You know, I, are you the charismatic kind of priest or the, you know, the traditional kind of priest? Are you going to, anyway, uh, we, you know, we're trying to figure out where everybody is and, and how to connect 
and maybe then try to convince them of our own uh, approach to these things. So we have that, that positional conversation. Both of these are important and they build connections, but if we get stuck in either of them, then they become stressful. Ask, tell starts to become interrogate and dictate. It's not helpful. Uh, and, and when we get stuck at that level that I don't really want to hear what you have to say, I only want to hear a narrow form of answer from you, I start interrogating you, or I just want to tell you what I think, I'm not interested in even having a conversation, that becomes stressful, starts to release cortisol. It takes place in the back of the brain, by the way. It's a very primitive form of conversation and not too different from Google, actually. Um, but the difference is that it, uh, it, it starts to build a foundation that we can move to a more human conversation from there. The second level, positional, again, can become a little bit stressful. It can become interesting to engage about ideas. I have my experiences, you have your experiences. We're kind of balancing these against each other. We're a little bit guarded in that and, and communicating it. It takes place in a, uh, in, the, in a middle section of the brain. It's a little bit more advanced part of our brain. And uh, again, it sort of, it helps to build trust to find out where people are. But the third level of conversation is uh, what Judith Glazer calls transformational. And the dynamic of that third level of conversation is share and discovery. And that's the kind of conversation where I feel totally free to express whatever's happening inside of me. I know that you're in a posture of discovery. You're actually willing to listen to me. You're willing to hear whatever I want to share. And I feel open to do that. And, uh, and also, likewise, there can be a mutuality or not, but that dynamic of share and discovery that it's, it's totally open. That, that conversation takes place in the most advanced part of the brain, in the prefrontal cortex, and it releases oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone, and it also is the one that makes us feel really good and helps us to feel confident and it releases stress, it washes out, uh, you know, other bad, bad feelings. There's a real connection that happens there. And it turns out, this is amazing, it turns out that staying in that transformational conversation for a period of time can actually change our DNA. I don't know if you're aware, that's relatively new research that DNA is capable of changing. DNA can actually grow. So through transformational conversations, we actually have structural changes in our bodies. So cells will reproduce according to these conversations. The people that we're talking to will reproduce, potentially, according to these conversations. It has a way of making generational changes when we're able to give someone that space that they can really open their hearts, that they can really share in the deepest way, when there's such total trust that they can share the deepest things. So moving toward that place of transformational conversation, again, having all of these qualities of, of transformative, of compassionate listening is part of creating that space that someone feels they can really trust you and they can really tell you what is going on in the depths of their hearts. They can really communicate what is most precious to them. So hopefully our unbound sessions uh, that you experience and the ones that you lead will also move toward that transformational conversation, that you create a space that someone can really pour out the depths, that you can help them name some of those things and help them to put words to it, give them courage and strength. It's interesting, you know, sometimes we, uh, and one of the dynamics of Unbound, I don't remember if this has been said, but Unbound is not providing counseling. So we don't do counseling in Unbound sessions. Uh, one of the things that's helpful with that is, again, Unbound is, is meant to be shared with the lay faithful who may not have all of the tools or all of the nuances. We've received a little bit more formation perhaps, but, but they're not in a position of providing counseling. So one of the things with counseling that, we tend to do is try to convince people of something, of, of a different approach. We try to help them. We give them some direction and point them in a different direction. It's a little bit more of a positional conversation. And we know that there's a need for that. Sometimes people are doing self-destructive things. They're taking wrong directions. We need to point them in the right direction. But <laughs> 
I often uh, re- try to remember if my response to someone is either stop it or try harder, usually that's not the right response. It turns out that most people have thought of that themselves and they don't really need us to tell, it, tell them that. But if we want to tell them stop it, really what they need is help in believing that they're able to stop it and sometimes just being able to share their story and then with our faith to be able to stand against the enemy's schemes, to renounce the lies and to take a step forward is precisely what they need to be able to stop it. Sometimes the positional conversation can only be fruitful if we actually go first into that share and discovery, that transformational conversation that builds some of the, even the human biochemistry and structural changes that someone needs to be able to take that step forward and stop it or have the courage, in fact, to face it again, to try harder and to move forward. So again, let me return to Our Lady to uh, close my talk and to look at her really as a model of listening. Our Lady listened to the angel. She allowed herself to be moved by the word that he spoke, to be troubled by what he said to her, but then ultimately to give, to yield in faith and to say, let it be done to me according to your word. She allowed her body to be molded by that word her womb to be formed to be able to bear the word of God. In a certain sense, she listened to the Father. She gave him that shared discovery conversation so much that he was able to say everything to her. And she was able to take everything into her womb, take everything into herself, and give him a, a, a place to be born. But then she listened. You know, she, she's the holiest woman in the world, and the shepherds came to her. These poor shepherds, Lord only knows what kind of uh, smells they had, let alone uh, education and way of speech and whatever else. They came and they talked, and she allowed herself to be amazed by them. Whatever shepherds come to us, can we have the amazement of Our Lady? Can we be amazed by what people share with us? Because every heart is a revelation of God, like the shepherds received in the field. And then after they spoke to her, She pondered these things in her heart. She really took them into herself. That word uh, pondering, she symbolane, she she threw them together. She put them together. She held them up against the things that she understood and knew. She allowed herself to really work with them, to take them in. And likewise, even after she heard something that confused her a little bit, that troubled her, son, your father and I were worried about you. Why did you do this? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And he went with them and was obedient to them. And she took all these things and pondered them in her heart. She took them in. So Our Lady really models for us the kind of obedient listening, humble, kind, gentle, patient listening that gives space for those who share their hearts with us to really grow and to be formed and ultimately to be set free. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, give us this grace of listening. Help each of us to grow in our capacity to receive others, to love them as Our Lady does, to listen as she does, and to receive through each one your word and to allow that word to find a place in our own hearts and to be formed within us. Help us to listen in a way that brings freedom and healing to others in all that we do, in Unbound and throughout all of our ministry. And we ask all this through Our Lady's prayers and through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.